I just got the notification that I'm being recorded now. Okay, um, but I so I always I always start with this one. It's it's the culmination of a few years where I did as mostly nothing but uh, drawing, um, generally graphite drawing on paper. Um, sometimes twenty two by thirty inches. Sometimes like this, seventeen feet. This is the biggest one I did, um, and it was uh, the culmination of those two years before which I was a, uh, an oil painter, um, which is what I was doing when I went through graduate school and uh, for my first New York solo show uh, after graduation. Um, and then I, then I sort of, I, I kind of found that I couldn't go forward with that work. So I, uh, I changed everything and I started uh, making nothing but drawings for a while while I kind of figured out a process that felt right to me. Um, so uh, th this piece was made from a, an existing story. Um, when I was growing up, uh, we had a, almost a, a family myth, except it was true, um, a story about my father. And um, I interviewed him telling the story and edited it. And that's the what plays on the speaker uh, inside of that sculpture, which is a sculpture of a speaker. Um, and uh, the story he tells is that in 1970, on Christmas night around midnight, he and his friends were driving home from a double date in Kansas, where uh, this was in, uh, uh, they had crossed back over uh, into Missouri. In Kansas, you could drink at 18. Um, and they were driving home from this this double date around midnight, and they're in this Camaro that you see on the right, um, bright red, brand new Z28 1970 Camaro. And they pull up behind the Buick Riviera that you see on the left uh, at a stop sign in their neighborhood. And this, the uh, they continue on, and the Riviera is going kind of slowly. They think maybe he's uh, the, the driver's looking for a party. Um, so my dad says he, he remembers maybe honking his horn, flashing his lights, something like that, and then sped around the car and continued along. And when he got to the next uh, stop sign, the Riviera had pulled up beside him like uh, they wanted a drag race. Um, and uh, my father was not unfamiliar with nefarious drag racing through the suburbs of Kansas City. So off they, they shot uh, racing one another until they got to his friend's house and uh kind of to his surprise the the riviera pulls in uh kind of menacingly you know angled toward them uh so my dad gets out of the car he goes to the passenger side window to ask what they want and the someone a shadowy figure rolls down the window um and he said he didn't see the person's face but he just saw the glint of light off the blade of the knife um as it uh came toward him and he swung his hand at the knife which cut his thumb and then plunged into his chest, into his heart. Um, and he didn't really understand the extent to which he had been hurt. So he turned and yelled to his friends to get inside the house and he ran to the door. He ripped the screen door off its hinges uh, because of the adrenaline. Uh, and he, then he burst into the house where his friend's sister was having a party and uh, kind of collapsed on the floor uh, right in the middle of the uh, group of people. But since it was wintertime, uh, he was wearing this heavy pea coat, so it wasn't clear what was up with him. Uh, it just happened to be the case that his friend's sister uh, was also an emergency room nurse, and so she was able to give him first aid and call the hospital and wake up the cardiac surgeon and, and effectively save his life. Um, so uh, this is all to say that this drawing was made in a really different way than I had been making uh, my paintings. Um, I, I had a story, um, in this case, a, a kind of developed through a do documentary research, um, and uh, that, that was what enabled me to make the sound piece, um, but uh, there was a lot of interview that didn't go into the piece, uh, in, into the, the recorded edit, that was me asking my dad, like, what did the car look like? What was the make and model? Did the house have two garage doors? Um, how snowy was it that year uh, at, at that, on that particular Christmas? Um, and all, you know, asking all the kind of factual details. And then, um, let me wake up my PowerPoint. Um, and then I used that to construct the scene. Um, so I would research those details. And so instead of uh, uh, 
finding a photo of the of a Riviera at that angle and then copying it or going into a used car lot or something and trying to find it, I would I would find images of bits and pieces and start to compo uh, composite it together to build the scene. Um, there was no kind of complete image at any point. It was all something that uh, got worked up in the act of drawing. Uh, he ended up okay. This is him uh, some years later. Um, so this process was really interesting to me that uh, uh, people's memories, that existing stories could uh, drive paintings that innately seemed kind of fictionalized, that there were these constructed things. Um, so a number of years later, uh, I put together an exhibition that was called Independence, Missouri, uh, which is where my parents lived before I was born. Um, and my dad had a retail auto parts store there. So I interviewed him also about that. Um, the auto parts store went out of business. He had, he had no uh, business experience other than that he loved cars and, uh, uh, and that he worked at an auto parts store. Uh, he worked at this auto parts store that failed and then he bought the business, rebranded it as Skip Speed and Sport, which is his. Uh, he, he goes by Skip and then it, it failed again. Um, this is a four by five foot painting on paper in uh, flash and acrylic, uh, imagining the last day of his store, the view from inside. Uh, there he is in the actual store. He kind of has one uh, one move. Um, in that exhibition, there was also a, a, what I thought of as kind of like a talking sculpture. Um, it's a, this uh, sculpture here, which is uh, chipboard, acrylic paint. Uh, there's an MP3 player inside and functioning headphones. Uh, it's a replica of a reel by reel uh, tape recorder that he had. And then the cinder blocks are um, what he used to make the shelving in the store. Um, and when you put the headphones on, you can hear him talking about the business and describing its kind of rise and fall. Um, after the business failed, he moved it into our house. And so this is the corner of our dining room uh, as I remembered it uh, when I was growing up. Uh, it's also a five foot uh, painting on paper. I liked that I was using only uh, unstretched paper, uh, uh, unstretched canvas, uh, for this particular show. I wanted everything to feel like it was the going out of business sale and you could just roll it up and take it with you. Um, I did a few paintings of his computer, um, just sort of like a portrait of him without painting him. Uh, this is his sense of humor. Uh, it, these are all from forwarded emails uh, that he has sent to me. Uh, being cremated is my last hope for a smoking hot body. Even though you're all on mute, I'm gonna assume that that really cracked you up. Um, this is a drawing that relates to work that was in that show. Um, I just I, I included this just to show that drawing is this kind of backbone to uh, to everything I do, um, and whether it's drawing in sketchbook to work up images, compositions, drawings from things, drawings from JPEGs. I have sketchbooks full of bad drawings of JPEGs. Um, the drawing is this kind of first filter that everything goes through. Um, I kind of have this this two-pronged practice of drawing and, and narrative um, uh, that, that runs through all of it. Uh, this is a, uh, these are both eight foot tall pieces of paper. It's a diptych, six by eight foot pieces of paper. So it's eight by 12 overall. Um, this is based on an interview I did with my mother about uh, the apartment she lived in, in Independence. And I just used her recollection to construct the apartment. Uh, that's just to give a sense of scale. Uh, this is at that show in San Etienne. Um, and again, it's constructed out of uh, numerous details of just things you could remember, things of my parents that I have, uh, that I own, like this Rolling Stones record, um, stuff that I remember that was still in our house. Uh, when she saw the works later, she was like, oh yeah, I remember that couch, but that, that we had that couch like 10 years later when you were, when you were a really little kid. Um, this painting was in the show. And it was uh, uh, a painted version of uh, her apartment, focusing on the living room and two times a day. Um, and I was, I during the interview, I I learned that uh, that apartment building, that apartment complex, was where she met my father. Um, so I thought of it as a kind of uh, almost almost like a you know a marriage portrait or a you know a meeting of the two of them. So he's behind the door on the on the left, and she's reflected in the window on the right. And one is night, and the other is day. Um, there he is behind the screen door. There's her silhouette. 
and the painting is the same size as the drawing. So it's eight feet tall, uh, 12 feet wide diptych, uh, unstretched canvas. And all my paint is, a, is acrylic and flash. Uh, flash is like a polyvinyl paint that you can mix with the acrylic. Uh, it's just like very matte. It looks like gouache, um, but it's just a, it has a synthetic binder that makes it really flexible. Um, I'm kind of going quickly through a few uh, older uh, shows just to give some some context. Um, this is a, a large painting from a show called Between the Days. Um, and in those prior two shows, I had a kind of uh, central text that I was working with that took the form of an interview. Um, and for the next two shows, that, that kind of uh, backbone um, it, for each was an animation. Um, and sometime around 2015, I started making animations again. Um, I did them when I was a student and I made, a, I made a lot of videos and other things, both as a student and not. Um, but I, in around 2015, I started doing them really seriously and exhibiting them, not using them just as sources for other things. Um, and so with this exhibition, I was interested that I, I could make paintings of a lot of different sizes and the paintings would get animated. Um, I could shoot in close up and uh, and get a lot more uh, different kinds of shots and camera angles from a single painting. So this is a, the painting is a, a seven and a half feet wide, um, but you can see some of the geometries like this over here. Uh, when I shot in close up, I would just tape it off so that um, I was creating some of the geometry that I would naturally paint as a way to kind of resolve compositional questions that I was grappling with. Um, so this uh, particular film um, takes place uh, in Missouri where a lot of my stuff is set. Uh, this, it's set more or less in my parents' house and a few other locations. And it tells the story of uh, this young man. Um, he's an adult, but he lives at home with his mother. And there are these two characters who go through one day uh, in their lives. Um, he uh, in the morning cleans up uh, beer cans and empties ashtrays from his mother's previous night. Um, and then uh, he goes off in his day. You don't really see where you, he goes and watches some trains and you don't know what he does after that. And then uh, the mother gets up and she goes off to work uh, at a factory um, and comes home and watches TV and drinks and smokes again. And so the whole thing loops around and around. So these are some of the smaller paintings as they wound up after the animation uh, process. So the animation would end and then, you know, I'd finish shooting it and then I would keep painting on the painting until the painting felt like it was uh, sufficiently resolved. So there are kind of parallels, portraits of both, images of both figures, their spaces, um, lots of lots of pairs that kind of happened in the, the exhibition. So there's the mother character. Um, there's her new ports burning down. Everything, a lot of the, these are about life size. Um, there's a there's a range of scales. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple of uh, minute long clips. Uh, I set it so that there should be sound, but if, there, if you don't hear anything, um, someone just holler at me. I have one more that was uh, from the initial scene where you see him kind of clean up. Um, I have one more where he uh, goes off uh, to look at the trains.
So there's where that painting of the inside of the Impala wound up. Um, so you're probably gathering that um, across these bodies of work, uh, there are lots of things that have to do with families that come back. There's lots of things that have to do with working, um, sometimes with visible labor or uh, depictions of people working. Um, those are kind of preoccupying concerns I have. Um, this is a five foot painting uh, on everything. All the paintings from here on are stretched canvas. Um, and it's kind of a way to revisit that computer image of my dad's computer. Um, but this is after shooting uh, Carol in her office. Um, and I shot the wide shots first, and then I shot in close up all of the kind of small activities that she would do. Um, and that's where you ended up with all these different moments where the hands are kind of fractured across the surface. Um, and I, I'm really drawn to the ways in which spaces are like portraits of people that inhabit them, that we leave all these traces. And so when I animate, I don't, I don't obscure the way that things move. And I also don't believe that there is a kind of, uh, I was talking with someone earlier today about this, that I don't believe there's like a passive background before which we just move. So I don't do any of the practical stuff that people are supposed to do with animation, of uh, like animating on a separate layer and having something move in front of a background. I think we sort of drag ourselves through our reality, leaving uh, trails and, and ripples uh, as we go. So uh, I was also thinking about, there's, there's a kind of, uh, I was raised Catholic, so there's this sort of like, Catholic thing that goes through everything, my obsession with bodies, um, but also sometimes literally like a character. Uh, in this case, the mother has like a Catholic calendar and has the Durr praying hands as a as a relief magnet. I, I don't know if that magnet exists. I'm sure it does. I would I'd love to have it. Um, uh, but I was also thinking about the, the this for Angelico painting um, and the way that other kinds of sensory information can be caught by a painting. Um, after I did that painting as part of that body of work, I was thinking about how interesting it was, just the hand on its own. So I made a hand sculpture, sort of a portrait of each character as a hand. Um, so here's the mother about to ash her cigarette. I realize I have a lot of memories from childhood of like adults smoking and forgetting to ash their cigarette and the ash gets to be about two inches long before it like kind of, maybe they catch it in time or it falls on the rug. Uh, and then here is his, the, uh, the son uh, with his Impala keys. I gave them both names because it kind of made them real to me. Uh, he was called James, um, but the, it, their names don't appear in the animation. Um, so it's kind of funny for me to call them by name, uh, but I do. Uh, this is uh, her smoking on her break at work. Um, so I'm gonna show another clip from this. I I'm trying to stay on time, but... Uh, I was, another thing that I was interested in that was important to this project and kind of led me to the next uh, the next animation um, was I, I started thinking about the the reality of the spaces when no one was there, like how they lived or like what the, what the dog would see. They don't have a dog, but you know, figuratively. Um, so I did a I did a number of these scenes where just no one was around and the light kind of moved on its own. Um, oh, I should say I do all the sound and music uh, myself. I, I really enjoy, one of the things I like about animation um, is that it and, and video in general is that it's a kind of uh, adhesive. Like I can I, you can just put so many things into a film, um, and it gave me an excuse that all the things I like to do for fun could be 
uh, something I did for work, <laughs> which sounds like, oh, does that make work more fun or fun less, uh, less fun? But it, it made everything more fun. Um, this is a, I had, there were two living room images uh, in this animation, and this was the other one. And so in the show, there was a daytime living room and a nighttime living room again. Um, but uh, in, the, in the video, you see this goes, it kind of starts in early evening with the lamp lit. Um, and this is just where it wound up. Uh, I made a lot of changes on these paintings. Um, this is a detail of the wall. I, 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 I thought maybe I could tell a whole family story through um, just things like the pictures on the wall and the knickknacks and, and things like that. Uh, and this was where the table ended up. I did I did put some severed hands in other paintings, uh, but they just didn't work, so I took them out. Um, but there was for a while a hand floating here by the beer cans uh, that was left over from from shooting. Uh, I've, I've taken out some of the clips because the the whole animation is about eighteen minutes long. Um, you're, it's on my website if anybody's interested. Um, but after the mother staggers off to bed, um, the son goes down these steps and uh, winds up in his space. Uh, you know, if hers is her office at work where she's able to kind of identify, um, his is in the basement where he's got the weightlifting. Uh, this also had severed hands. You can kind of see them here holding onto the barbell. Um, it was just too absurd to have two severed hands holding a barbell or holding the yeah, the 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 weight. Um, plus, uh, having Arnold Schwarzenegger's chest there was sufficient to kind of have a have the body, you know, taken taken apart. Um, so, uh, it, essentially, the animation ends when he is he bench presses until he has like achieves muscular burnout and uh, almost crushes himself with the weights before he throws it off his chest. Um, and then they all do it again the next day. Um, the the part where I was doing animation about the space when no one was there really got me thinking about spaces and in, in, in the animations and, and the way uh, the structure of cinema allows you to kind of like move into a space and inhabit it in a way that is really distinct. Um, and I, just, I, find, I still find it just irresistibly attractive. I'm doing two animations right now uh, that are that just involve moving into spaces with no one there. Um, but I had an, uh, uh, I did a show called Three Rooms, which was also the name of the animation that was kind of central to that body of work. Um, and the, the animation has uh, two parts. One part uh, is depicted in these acrylic and flash paintings. Um, and the other part, uh, that's a little confusing to look at while I'm talking about this. The other part is in a kind of in, uh, a science fiction world that um, exists within uh, a kind of story within a story. Um, so a thing that I did differently with this project is I built all these sets so I could get a kind of depth of field in some of the shots. Um, and the sets were, were fairly small. Um, a lot of the paintings were very big. So the painting that's behind that doorway is six and a half feet. Um, but the set that's in front is maybe 18 inches wide, something like that. Um, that's how that painting wound up at the end of everything after shooting and then trying to make it into a painting. Uh, I might've taken out the clip uh, that goes with that for time. Um, when we go into that room, there's, there's three characters and each is uh, kind of ex exemplified by a room in the house. Um, and I, at this time, uh, my partner was pregnant and I, we were anticipating our, the birth of our daughter. And so I was thinking a lot about family in a different way. Um, so there's a, the, in the narrative, there's a married couple and a, and a daughter. And so the, the guy is a, a science fiction writer and the sci-fi story that we inhabit through part of the narrative is the book that he's written, uh, which is called 4036. It's just a painting of the book cover. Um, and, uh, I had the idea, uh, I was thinking about like global warming and I was thinking about all the things that we do that have these repercussions into the future. Um, and so I, I thought, well, it's really hard to think about even a hundred years from now, I'll just double the date. And it was 2018. So it became 4036. Um, so this little clip that I want to show, uh, we go through his office and you kind of look at his influences. I've made a, I was, I, I stopped short of like, pinning up the yarn lines, but it's like, it's like the detective's obsession wall. 
um, but it's but about the creative process. Um, and then we go into uh, inside of his book and you'll see the, the, the shift in, in how things look. So I had this idea that there would be this kind of hazardous future world um, where like the mushrooms have won and everything is in this sort of sort of hazard yellow, uh, sort of what I thought of as like the color of spores or something. Um, and the daughter in, in the, uh, the kind of acrylic world, the real world where you don't see anyone, um, she's a child because you see this dollhouse that she has um, and children's toys. But in this world, she's the explorer in the hazmat suit. And uh, in exploring this terrain, um, she eventually finds her way to the house, which is the house where in 2018, she presumably lived. Um, and there uh, she sees her parents who are just kind of living through their daily repetitious uh, habits. Um, and the, her mother is a mycologist. So there's these images of growing mushrooms and things like that. Um, but the parents don't seem to see her they're like ghosts of habits. Um, and then she eventually finds her way to her room, which is where she winds up in, in the end of the film. Uh, these are all done in Sumi ink and watercolor on a light box. So they have this kind of illuminated from behind uh, slide uh, kind of look and everything is very slippery and liquid in the way that it's animated. Uh, I have some images of uh, these corner, sort of like the living room, the dining room, these kind of hub spaces that were kind of a, the intersection between where the each of the characters had their own uh, habitation. Uh, this is a, a six and a half foot painting. This one was smaller, maybe uh, 30 inches, somewhere in there. So these sort of conversation spaces the characters pass through. Um, and I, I was thinking a lot about uh, Andrei Tarkovsky and the way that, you know, he was uh, someone I was thinking about in terms of how space gets uh, shot on film and how spaces can kind of exist at a duration that uh, seems antithetical to storytelling. Um, this is a, a still from his film, The, the Mirror. Uh, this is the... Uh, the mother's space. Uh, she had she had two spaces. She has this office, and then there's a, a kind of greenhouse space, uh, which is this one. So the previous one was a six and a half foot painting. This one's four feet across. I know that mushrooms don't need sunlight to grow, uh, but uh, paintings paintings help. It helps paintings grow uh, to have light. Um, and I realized at this point I've just been sort of. Uh, thinking about late Brock all the time, even though I never really 
It was never a painter. I thought I like clay. I, I like Brock. I, at no point did I sit down and think that. And just I just started making paintings that had more and more of these kind of subdivisions. Um, and and so I sort of found my way to him completely indirectly, almost like I dreamed him into the work. And then I went and saw that, oh, he'd, he'd influenced me. And I just didn't have any, I was never aware of it. I never had a book out from the library or anything, uh, but there he was. All right, one more clip. This is another one of the sets that I built. Of a, an abrupt stop, um, we go through the whole uh, dollhouse in the in the animation. Um, I when I showed the paintings in the film together, I also showed the sets, including some sets I didn't uh, end up using in the animation. Um, I had sort of uh, big ambitions for these sets. I they they fully came apart, every door functioned, uh, and then I ended up using it for just that one shot. I often think that. Uh, I'm going to in it, come up with some innovation like these three-dimensional sets that are going to save me loads of time, and then they 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 take forever. But um, that's just how the work goes. So I like that they had this front and back. They had the theatrical side, and then this kind of behind the you know behind the scenes back of the set kind of thing that were very rough. Uh, and then this is the painting that was associated with I associated with the daughter. Um, so they're very big surfaces to be animating on. I had to, when I animated that uh, dollhouse turning around, I, I really had to like psych myself up for, for a while because um, I fully paint the painting and so it looks like it's finished and then I start things moving. Um, and then to finish the painting, I had to turn the dollhouse back around. Um, so th that show was 2019, I want to say, and then this was 2020 uh in la um this in the interim covid started and uh everything just went bonkers um uh, but i made three animations uh that i wanted to separate from the paintings on canvas it was feeling like it started out as this very exciting thing this kind of freeing thing about the paintings to change them so much which is already something i was into but i've changed them far more to make the animations um and it started to feel like a constraint and I, and I didn't like that. So I made three animations set in an imaginary small town in Missouri. And I, I really spent much less time on them. Uh, they were painted small and gouache on Duralar. Um, I have one for you uh, after I show these images. Um, but it was just very liberating to be making paintings on their own by their own logic. Some of them could be vertical. Like I didn't have to follow the aspect ratio of film anymore. Um, so it it uh, it suddenly felt freeing to make what seemed like a fairly straightforward painting, um, and it made it feel new. Um, so it was it kind of exciting to come back around to. Um, so I have a few installation shots here, but so these are characters who some of them are in the animations, but some of them are just created for paintings. Um, it was helpful for me to think that they all lived in the middle of Missouri um, and that that became a kind of framework for them. Um, I was thinking a bit about the context of the pandemic, but also the kind of economic uh, backlash, people out of work, um, a sort of economic precariousness in which people live, which is kind of like an abiding, like something I just always think about. Um, so this is a guy uh, who runs a local uh, lawn care business. Um, this guy works at the liquor store. There's, anim there's an animation about each of these characters. 
Um, but it rather than being an animation that generates a painting or a painting that generates an animation, there's a kind of narrative world and the work for me descends down from it. Um, so it's, it's the story and the drawings that really uh, lead to everything else. They come first. Um, so these are about four feet, um, these kind of portraits. Um, there's the outside of the liquor, liquor store that he works in. This is a six foot painting. That's him behind the door, just uh, getting ready to open for the day. Um, this guy doesn't have an animation. This guy is sort of like the problematic father figure in the show. Um, uh, he's uh, the the sort of like so many of the dads of my dad and people I grew up with, um, who I don't agree with at all politically. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's like uh, I don't know, going right to the going right to the trouble to me. Um, uh, I like to paint people and places that I feel ambiguity toward. Um, so family members who are um, totally right wing, for instance. Um, this is a character that kind of came about in the in this body of work. Um, I, I spent summers going to the Lake of the Ozarks when I was a kid. It was my favorite place. Um, and so I have, I have some of these scenes set there. I'm just imagining characters sort of out of work, uh, going to the lake, trying to find some, some place to some kind of solace. Um, these are two friends uh, sharing a cigarette, which at that moment seemed like the most taboo thing you could do. I mean, it was also very political, like who wore masks and it, as you all remember, um, but uh, yeah, the, thinking about the kind of divisions and barriers between people. Um, and I started, uh, there's a, I have a few images of this uh, father, son, auto repair business. Um, and I started thinking about uh, the images of the car that I, I've painted a lot of images of cars, um, many that I didn't show. Um, and they're always kind of father images to me. Um, and so uh, I kind of invented this father and son auto repair. Um, this painting started out and there was actually a father and son in the behind the glass. Um, and then I realized that the, the business had to be closed. Um, I, I went through so many states and then finally I took the figures out and then it, and then it, and then it made sense to me. There's a detail. The, the foot is life size, so it's it's a pretty big painting. And then here are the father and son over the engine. Um, this is the this is sort of the son character again. I had a few paintings of this guy in the letter jacket. He went, he's got my high school letter jacket on. I never wore that thing. Um, and then not long after that show, I had, uh, last spring I had two shows, I mean, 2021. Um, and this was the one in New York called Furlough. Um, and it, it kind of builds on some of those themes I was thinking about before. Uh, a lot of white working class people um, who were in a kind of economically precarious moment. Um, and I called the show Furlough because I, I kept reading about people who were out of work, but couldn't get collect benefits uh, because their their uh, their bosses had furloughed them rather than laying them off. You turn the corner in the gallery, and this guy's just taking a leak. Um, this was the largest painting in the show. Um, it was about six and a half feet tall, um, but I was using these really dark. Uh, tonal extremes, like figures heavily backlit, kind of, this looks even a little darker than the painting, um, but people sort of submerged in, in this darkness, but in this beautiful place uh, going to the lake. This one really was this dark. Um, this painting you could see a lot more in person, but you had to really move around it because uh, parts of the surface were shiny and, and parts weren't. Um, so you, you had to interact with it to see everything, these two guys. Um, 
just I imagine them the day that they found out that they were, you know, they were coming back to work and just what they went to do. So I did a bunch of these three by four foot paintings. Started to feel like a very natural size. Here's the, the letter jacket guy again. Uh, this one's called Countdown. I was just picturing, I mean, it's even more true now, but like, you know, looking at the the gas pump, the numbers on the on the pump just rolling by and thinking about your paycheck, like how much you need to get by just to get to work to get the next pay. Here's our here's our lawn care friend again with his with his uh gorgeous pink uh I thought of this as like his pink Gustin boot. Uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, guys, a bunch of people watching the Super Bowl. We, it, I was painting this when the, the Kansas City Chiefs were in the Super Bowl, um, and then they lost while I was painting it. I was like, that's just perfect. Um, this is called Magic Hour. This this might be, you know, sometimes in a body of work, there's a painting you just you just fall in love with. It's like you're, you don't, uh, it just ends up being your favorite. And I, I really like Janet. She, uh, there were, I would, I was also learning about people who, and thinking of people that I knew um, back in Kansas City, you know, where people are out of work because of uh, COVID. And then some people would go back to jobs that would have, it, a lot of women would go back to jobs that the men wouldn't take, um, like being a cashier, um, people who had, who had either been staying at home or um, maybe had been retired. Um, and I was just, I was just thinking about, uh, uh, you know, the, these women who are providing, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I deliberately made the other cashiers, uh, much younger. Um, but here she is, here's Janet. Um, so I have an animation there, but I'm going to skip through it. Cause I'm, I'm realizing, even though we started late, we're going over time. Uh, this was a large painting that was in the, uh, show in London. Um, and now I have like 40 slides of stuff I've done the last year. Um, how would I just start skimming through them and then and we can and uh, we can start doing questions. <laughs> um, I feel like I went from like sort of fun to much less fun uh, as I as I've talked my way through this thing. I'll go I'll go to I'll go to a smaller screen and people can. Uh, I've, it seems like people have been saying things in the chat, but I can't see that. I um I actually had one question um, from someone in chat from Sarah. Sarah asked what the hand sculptures are made from. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the inside is like a like a pink foam, um, and then there's magic sculpt epoxy resin on top of that, and uh, and then acrylic and flash paint, and then the stand is just wood. Um, I have an I have a comment from Taylor saying that uh, your paintings make the domestic and the mundane so magical. Is this something you experience during your day to day life and aim to capture, or something that comes to fruition during the art making process? Um, yeah, that's a good. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, it, it well, the I guess the the quality of light and uh, the thing that seems to disrupt the everyday in the work comes about through painting. Um, and I, I start them really, they're, they're just a big joyful mess of paint when I, when I start them. Um, like I just squeeze tubes right out onto the canvas and I use, uh, I have a big mate, like a big concrete and masonry brushes that are like, I have one that's a foot wide and another that's two feet wide and big uh, kitchen spatulas and stuff that I like to start them with. And that helps me find some of those things because I am really interested in the place. Maybe it's my like latent Catholicism, but I'm interested in those places where the everyday it becomes transcendent. There's some kind of rupture um, to the expectation. Um, so yeah, I I am really trying for that. I, I I mean, I suppose the every the thing that I do experience outside of making the paintings that inspires that is just a you know it's like when you feel a feeling of poignancy. Um, that I, I guess that's what I'm trying to do. This is just a whole bunch of paintings I made this last year. I've been I've been busy, and these are all big ones too. 
I have another question from Olivia that says, um, to what extent are your paintings invented? What informs your understanding of how light works in space? And what informs your color decisions? Um, also a good question. Um, so the, the paintings, I think in the sense that you're thinking of, they're really heavily invented. Um, like I don't have a picture that looks, I, I started painting botanical paintings, weeds uh, this last year. So a bunch of weeds for y'all. Um, but like, I don't have a picture of a dandelion that I'm looking at that looks anything like this. I have these field guides that have like a line drawing of just like some of the parts that I would use to make some of these. Um, for the figures, uh, the people I just work up in drawings. Um, and uh, uh, here, I'll put a person up. Um, like, I might be going around town and see a guy walking his dog and I'll think of that. And then I'll go back to my sketchbook and I'll, I'll try to draw a person walking their dog. And maybe I've drawn a lot more people than I've drawn dogs. So the person will be okay. The dog will be sort of dog shaped, like a dog shaped lump. And then I'll look up, I'll be like, it's probably going to be a pit bull. Maybe I decide that. And then I'll look at a, like dozens of pictures of pit bulls and sketch some of them. Um, and then have those sketches at hand when I'm trying to make the painting. Sometimes just making the sketches helps me uh, do the dog, uh, paint the dog. Um, uh, <clears throat> other times, like occasionally I'll have, these days I'll sometimes have a photo on a laptop nearby, like of the tent, I you know, the make of the tent. Um, I did have the laptop out for that. Um, but for a long time, I'd always draw it first because I didn't trust myself not to like, go wild and just put every thread in, <laughs> onto the tent or something like the photo I was worried it was going to give me too much information and I didn't trust my imagination to, to give me enough um but now I don't feel so nervous about that so I'm I'm okay with occasionally having a picture for just stuff that I can't make up um like I had a picture of I kind of roughed in one of these uh wet floor signs but then the actual like what does the falling guy on the wet floor thing look like I looked it up um, but sometimes it's good to not know what something looks like so that I feel free to abstract it so that it becomes the shape it needs to be in the painting. So um, I sort of take liberties about that. Like I never looked up what a, the back of it, I'm sure this is not what the back of a basketball hoop looks like, but I just needed it to be a curved line that felt like a curved back, you know, or like the top of her head. Um, and then in terms of the light, that that just exists in the paintings. I kind of I, I work that up in drawings, um, just like I work up people's faces in drawings. It's you know I think about the characterization, like what sort of face the guy with the black eye is going to have, um, and and I kind of had the idea that it would be backlit. There'd be all this light on the basketball court, but I don't remember at what point that arrived. Um, maybe just to help me make the shape of the hand and the head. Um, yeah, a lot of it comes about in the painting. Like this one, I wanted to silhouette that hand, so I just put an irrational block of light there. Uh, if that if that answers your question. So thank you. Uh, we also have another question from Nicolette. Do you mostly use a palette knife or a paintbrush? Oh, I use all kinds of stuff. Uh, fingers. I wear gloves, but I use my fingers, and I use. I have a bunch of knives and I use brushes and um, paper towels a lot. I like to rub the paint around. Um, I have some blades for scratching back into it. Um, I haven't used it in a while, but I have like syringes to squeeze out paint, um, like chem chemistry lab syringes. Um, it's, yeah, I just play around a lot. Um, I use a lot of brushes though, a lot of brushes and fingers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, David wants to know, do you rotoscope the animations or what software do you use? Uh, no rotoscoping. I, I feel the same way about rotoscoping that I do about um, having photos for my paintings, um, which is like, I want to feel like I'm building them. Everything is built out of paint in this kind of contiguous world, you know, that, that there's not something that's separated out into a different uh, thing. Um, so yeah, with the animations, I just, uh, I mean, this, the clips that I showed are as far as the movements go, they're, they're super rudimentary. Um, so, you know, things are mostly just like 
plotting, you know, just sort of smudging it along. Um, I've gotten maybe a little more sophisticated with it. Um, but I, I also just don't find it very, I've occasionally used lineup footage to, to kind of trace over and I, I just don't find it very fun. Um, I, I capture everything in a, in a program called Dragon Frame uh, and it, it's major advantage for the, the kind of thing I do is that you can just see what your, uh, you can play back your footage in real time. You, the camera is attached to the computer. So that's incredibly helpful. Um, and now I'm working on a project that has dialogue. So it lets me put dialogue uh, I can time out all my dialogue and then and then animate with while hearing the dialogue uh, frame by frame. So uh, that that makes it so much easier. I don't know how I could do this sort of uh, stop motion animation I do with, with dialogue. Uh, I don't think it'd be possible. Um, and then I just edit everything in uh, Premiere Pro, uh, Adobe Premiere. And uh, yeah, yeah, Dragon Frame is great. It's I really recommend it if you if you're interested in animation, this kind of thing. Awesome, thank you. And then we have one more question uh, from Adam. The way you draw and paint the figures is really interesting. Do you have any specific stylistic references for them or is it just something that emerged organically over time? Um, if, I, if I understand the question, it's the second thing. Um, but I, um, like, I, don't I, I tend to not think of style as like something exterior to to me or to the work um, that it's it's really it comes about through solving um, challenges of like composition and light then and and also invention like how do you put that figure into that space like how does this I, how do I get this woman to lean on the car um, in a compelling way when I'm when I'm trying to create it out of both my imagination and just seeing shapes and stuff in front of me and and trying to uh view into them the the figure uh that i'm trying to create or the hubcap i'm trying to create whatever it is um so i i, I don't think of style as like something i get to pick out um just just like uh you know when when someone sings you don't get to pick out your voice it's you do what you can with what you've got um and it's funny because the painting is exterior to me uh, but i think i think the most interesting things that we call style just come about by people being ever more themselves in their work any other um, questions uh I think that's all the questions that I see in the chat, unless anyone else has one they want to throw out real quick. Awesome. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Matt, for coming in and, you know, letting us look at your artwork. Um, I would just like to say that this has been a really good uh, group so far, especially for the past two. I think we made it to 40 participants, including the rest of us, but I think we made it to 40 partic participants, which is I think two more than last time. And so I'm hoping that we, we keep this momentum going. Um, but I also just wanna make sure that everybody knows that we'll have another artist um, next week. Their name is, and I really do apologize if I butcher this. Their name is Dewey Hong. I think that's how you pronounce it. Kate, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> good, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so that'll be um, next week, next Wednesday on the, uh, don't quote me. Six, seven? I can't remember what Wednesday seven, was. Seventh, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it'll be next Wednesday, so. Once again, thank you everybody for coming and I hope y'all all had a good time. And Matt, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for all those questions. Great talk. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Talk. Love your work. <laughs> thank you all, have a good night. Thank you, Matt.
do not leave. <laughs> we can. I'll just email him. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just ask him if he has any like issues or questions. He can just shoot us an email. I feel so bad about the leave thing, so <laughs> I'm not gonna try to get him back. Oh, he just emailed us and oh. he said, he said, I forgot to stay on. Should I jump back on? Yeah, he can. We're, we're still yeah. here. Okay, I'll tell him. Yeah, I, I also feel bad because the morning meeting was like, we were like 10 minutes late with that too. So yeah, I feel bad. We'll figure it out. That's great. So. Oh yeah, he was so kind about it. I was so young. I remember his lecture in like 2016 and I was like just a little baby and I remember him he's good yeah I didn't I didn't know that he had um lectured at Tampa before but then I started like researching about him and I was even like watching lectures he gave at other schools and I was talking to him about that during the critique I was like I love what you said to the New York school about Buffy the Vampire Slayer (laughs) oh my gosh yeah the yeah, yeah he's, he's funny. Yeah, I love the you know me with the with the triangles. I love my triangles. <laughs> <laughs> I was not at all prepared, guys. Not at all prepared. Same. I like you did. You did I'm good. Like, okay, that was good, a lot like, better than I. If I had to improvise off the fly, <laughs> it would have. I would have cried maybe. So you did great. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I I was like trying to speak and then also go back and find the documents I was supposed to be right. looking at. And so it was just like, <laughs> hi, thank you for sorry, jumping back I for- on. Totally forgot. No, I was in the you're I was fine. in the flow of like, yeah, uh, you know. Bye, everybody. I'll see. You. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we won't take up too much of your time. We just wanted to kind of ask how your experience was, if there were any issues, uh, aside from the obvious Zoom issues that we did have, <laughs> um, and then if there was just anything that you would change or that you think we could do better in the future. No, I really thought it was great. I thought your organization was excellent. The emailing and everything was very clear, um, and I really appreciate that, like having it all spelled out. The, the schedule was was all good. Um, yeah, the only thing was just uh, the confusion with the Zoom link. Um, right. Yeah, of course. And I I don't know how to. I don't know if it's possible to have the crits in the same one as the lecture or something. If that would mm-hmm. make it a little easier, but I mean, it's a. It worked out. It, I mean, really, it was not a big deal. <laughs> so uh, that was the only hiccup. Okay. I could view okay. the work well. The the Google Drive worked. Um, one student put like. Uh, some of the students didn't caption their work. That would be actually be one thing that might be helpful. Um, okay. is just having like, uh, I'm now I'm forgetting names, but the first person I met with, uh, maybe Ashley, is that right? Um, um, Ashley was in there. I think the first person was Sam. I also did not caption oh, no, my I, work. I, 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 I think I met, Ash- oh no, Sam was worth it. I was thinking of Ashley though. Um, Cause she did a good job of, she had uh, captions on all those paintings. And it's just because I'm looking at them online, it's super helpful to know what the materials are and the size. Right. Um, but uh, other than that, um, yeah, I did notice that some people put them into a Google slide presentation and some as a PDF. Um, mm-hmm. And I forget, one of them let me easily zoom in and the other didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but whichever one Probably you can zoom on. The PDF, I think you could zoom, yeah. Because um, okay. I, I was just using my browser window zoom and it was it was great because I could, you know, as long as the resolution of the image was okay and they all were good, I mm-hmm. could see details. Um, and again, it's just like what to do with this wacky virtual thing. But um, I like being able to really get in close to things. Um, so that would, yeah, two, two small suggestions. Okay, thank you so much. Very awesome. thoughtful. Yeah, 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 thank you. But the work looked great and you all were wonderful. And thank you for that introduction. I'm sorry about <laughs> I <laughs> gave you all the hard words. <laughs> I try so hard with like with like different languages and how they pronounce things, but like my brain like just it it ruptures like halfway through. We were all you can do is do your best. And we all, you know, the best thing to we go forth in a in a in a spirit of apology. All this I just think that's the best thing. But you did great. Thank you. Uh, and the state names, they did I went to school in Texas. They don't offer geography. <laughs> they don't offer geography. 
<laughs> well, they it, it, outside of Texas itself. It's like, hey, we're Texas. Hey, there's nothing <laughs> you need to know other than Texas. And Florida, and California. Florida, yeah. <laughs> well, thank all you right. so much, guys. Yes. yes. Well, we will let you go. Um, we kept you around all day. So um, have a good night. And thank you again. A really, really amazing lecture. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. No problem. Feel, feel free to reach out to the VAP email anytime with any questions at all. Yes. Thanks. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye. Have, have a nice a good night. night. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye.